All right. Well, th thank you again, Lori, and uh, to all our volunteers. And please do help spread the word. And um, I, I, I think these days people will at least understand that, you know, if, if we run out of food at the last fish fry. And come so early. just tell everybody to come early. Tell everybody to come early and maybe we can get out early. That's right. Let us join together in our call to worship. God of sea and sky, you keep the earth flourishing. Holy One, you give water that sustains body and spirit. Miracle worker, you caused a rock to crack and bring forth water. Let us pray. Holy One, we are thankful for who you are and all that you are. Your presence is desired here. We take joy in knowing that you are as close to us as our next breath. We thirst for you. May we be filled to overflowing with your love. Amen. Our first hymn is number 359, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, we thank you today for all the ways that you provide for us. We thank you even for the snow that will provide the water for the farms. We pray that you be with those who are in sick, sick and in need this week. We pray for Barb. We pray for Vi. We pray for Jerry as he enters hospice, and we pray that you would be with his family as well. We pray for those who mourn, including the family of Dave Collette. We pray that you would comfort all who mourn, 
that you would give them hope and strength in this time. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts to be aware of the needs of those around us, and that you would help us find ways to care and serve those in our world who struggle, those who do not have enough to eat, those who do not have a safe place to live, those who live in fear of violence and unrest here and around the world. Help us make this a world of peace and justice for all your children. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering plates are by the door. Let us take a moment to sing and bless our offerings. Fount of blessing, receive our gifts in the joy that we give them. Be it time, tithe, or talent, it all comes from you. Thank you for blessing us to be a blessing to you and each other. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Exodus 17. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders with you. Take your, in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and the water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called this place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Our psalm is Psalm 95, which remembers that same story. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people whose hearts go astray, and they do not regard my ways. Therefore in my anger I swore they shall not enter my rest. And our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Joseph, Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, 
Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where the people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, this interaction with the woman at the well. It shows Jesus' personality, his actions as a bit of a troublemaker, stirring things up, challenging the rules. It also talks about water, a topic I've read and thought a lot about over the years in terms of how it shows up in the Bible, even before I chose my dissertation topic to be about ritual baths and baptism. But I'm not going to keep you here all day to talk about that. It's also a text full of areas where it's easy to get distracted by other issues. Many times when this passage is talked about the woman, there are speculations about the woman in terms of the five husbands and why she's going in the middle of the day. And We'll come back to that in a moment. Water is a big theme in the Bible. We probably shouldn't be surprised for people living in a dry climate like that. Having enough water and good water is a matter of life or death. Now around here, I know it's usually more a question of having too much water or too much water where it's not supposed to be, like in our basements. And like you're probably like me and tired of the snow by this time. 
but water is one of our basic needs for survival. We can survive briefly without food, but not without water. Water shows up in the Bible, in the creation story, in the rivers of the Garden of Eden, in the Red Sea as God makes a path through the sea for the Israelites, and in today's story in the desert as God gives water to the Israelites during the Exodus. The Exodus story shows several moments where the people complain and they don't trust God. I mean, I I can understand it. When we face struggles, it can be easy to be afraid, to be worried, to not trust. When everything looks bad, it's, it's hard to hold on to hope. And having traveled in the deserts in Israel, it can be pretty bleak. But the interesting thing is that even in the middle of the desert, there is still life. And it was, I think, around this time of year when when we traveled to the desert, pretty near to the area described in our story today. And even though the rains were wrapping up for the year, because in Israel it only rains from about September till until about March, there were flowers in the desert. There, you couldn't see any streams, but there were flowers, little irises and other flowers showing up. And you could see that there had to be underwater streams of some sort because there was sort of a line of trees. There would be one, and then 50 feet further there'd be another one, and you could just sort of follow that line. And you would know that somewhere there had to be water. Not easily accessible, but the tree roots could get there. So it's easy to understand how they would wonder where they would find water in the midst of the wilderness. But at the same time, this is not the first time that they had been in danger and God had provided. They were enslaved in Egypt and called out to God and God rescued them. God sent the plagues and eventually convinced Pharaoh to let them go. They made it to the Red Sea and were trapped because Pharaoh changed his mind and God made a path through the water. In the chapter just before this in Exodus, they were hungry and called out to God and complained again. God, why did you bring us into the wilderness where there's no food? And God provided the manna. God provided birds for them to eat. But each time, they forget about all those things God has done in the past. They complain again and again and again. As I was reading it yesterday, I was thinking it sounded sort of like those car trips. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm tired of being in the car. God did eventually bring them to the promised land, but it took a long time. Unfortunately, as Christians read these stories, we often turn it into criticism of the Jewish people, criticism of the Israelites for complaining, as if we don't complain. I think it's more a matter of human nature than just being able to point to one group or another. We all complain. We all worry. Even when we've survived problems in the past, we still worry. Even if we haven't survived particular problems, we know people who have. We've heard the stories of our families. We've heard the stories of this congregation knowing the struggles that people survived in the past. And instead of starting with the thought that God has helped us in the past, God will help us again, it is easy to go straight to the, well, how could God let this happen? Why did God make us face this? And I should also note that in this story, God gets a bit cranky and tired of the complaints. And the Exodus reading stopped before it got to this point, but the psalm reminds us that in fact, because of their complaints, God made that generation wait in the wilderness. And it wasn't until the next generation 
who had grown up in the wilderness and seen the ways God had provided, that then made it to the promised land. This fear and lack of trust creates an interesting contrast for Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, who doesn't hesitate to ask him for what she wants, for the living water that he describes. As I said earlier, sometimes this passage has turned into a focus on the woman, on what was wrong with her, what led her to be at the well at that part of the day, and just what was going on with the description of her multiple husbands. But this story talks about tradition. It talks about rivalries between cultural groups. And it shows Jesus stretching, stretching the lines. But as I was looking at some things to get ready for today, it reminded me that there are some other really interesting things behind this story. This is not the first time that there's an unusual or important encounter at a well. In fact, you might almost start to think that based on some of the stories in the Bible, that, that lacking coffee shops and bars and places to hang out, that wells were the sort of meeting spot for people trying to date because Isaac meets his future wife, Rebecca, at her father's well. Jacob and Leah and Rachel meet at a well. Moses runs into the wilderness to escape punishment for killing an Egyptian overseer, finds his way to a well where he meets his future wife. So Jesus' followers and people hearing this story might might wonder just what Jesus was doing, waiting at a well. Who was he expecting to show up? As the woman points out, it is a little bit surprising that he would ask a Samaritan woman for water, both the fact that she was a woman and, in Jesus' time, men did not usually interact with women who were unchaperoned, but also the fact that she was a Samaritan. The Samaritans lived in the land that had once been the northern, the, the land, the home of the northern tribes, the tribes of Israel that were defeated and taken away by the Assyrians. The Samaritans were brought in their, in their place. Historians assume that some, some of the new people brought in intermarried with the few people that were left behind, and so they were sort of the country cousins of the people of Judah. They didn't have some of the books of the Bible and teachings that the Jewish people had. And so the Jewish people recognized that they were related, but didn't really trust them. And so when the Jewish people were concerned about the dietary laws and purity, they wouldn't trust the ways that the Samaritans lived. And yet Jesus asked her for water. Some, sometimes scholars, and I know I've looked at this myself, have speculated about the time of day. In many cultures where people still have to walk to the well to get water, particularly if you have to walk a long distance, people will try to go there early in, well, people, and specifically it's often in many cultures a job for women, will walk early in the day so that they can be there when it's cool and still walk back when it's cool. In many cultures, when people have, when people, specifically women, have to go to the well, going to the well becomes a sort of social gathering. I know that on one of my trips to India, we were visiting a small village and it was no longer just a well, there was actually a pump and a spigot but, they, but people would still have to go and carry the water back. And I remember seeing that some of the water jugs were labeled UNICEF. I don't know about you, but I remember as a child going and trick-or-treating for UNICEF and collecting money. And so it was, it was kind of neat to see the impact in a faraway place. But if going to the well was a social event, 
Some people have wondered, well, why wouldn't she be going at the time of day when everyone else was there? Why would she be going alone? We find out in the middle of the story this whole bit. Jesus calls, tells her to call your husband, and she says, well, I have no husband. And he plays his little mind reader trick and says, well, yes, I know you have no husband because you've had five, but the man you're with now isn't your husband. Some people have read a lot into that, assumed that, that she's some kind of sinner, maybe even a prostitute. I've read some speculation and, under, and explanations that either she was very unfortunate in marriage, or she was one of those cases that Jesus talks about in a parable and gets talked about in the, in the Jewish law, that if a man dies, his widow is expected to marry his brother. And then if that man were also to die, she would have to marry another brother um, to, to keep children and inheritance in the family. Now, certainly this is not a practice that is thought about too much anymore, but that might be a way to explain how she had five husbands. Some people speculate that perhaps instead she had been taken in by another man as a concubine. Again, not something that we recognize and encourage at this time, but an unmarried, unattached woman in that time period was at risk. So whether some might judge her or not, it is worth asking at least whether she was not smart in trying to make even uncomfortable decisions to try to care for herself. But in any case, that in some ways seems to be a side issue. Because even the fact that she is surprised, and later the disciples are surprised to see him talking to her, reminds us of the divisions that we too sometimes have in our own society. Did you see him talking to her? Did you see him talking to that person of a different ethnic group? Oh my goodness. Politics, ethnicity, gender can still cause divisions. But the other interesting thing about this story, which echoes some of what happened in last week's reading with Nicodemus, is that even though they speak the same language, they're talking about different things because last week Nicodemus thought Jesus was talking about literally be being born, going back inside your mother and being reborn, which is obviously not possible. And Jesus was talking in a spiritual metaphorical sense. So here he starts talking about literal water and then turns to talking about living water. Now there's also a play on words here, and this was something that came up in my dissertation because in Hebrew, living water can mean running water, spring water, fresh water, in other words, and not just water that has been sitting in a puddle or, or a, a um, reservoir for a long time. But this woman thinks he's still talking about water, that somehow he can offer her water that she doesn't need to, doesn't need to carry home. And he finally explains that he's not talking about water to drink, but he's talking about spiritual, a spiritual source of life, of, of nourishment and, and provision. And the odd part is that finally, when they're finally understanding each other and she realizes who he is and what he's offering, she runs back to the city and leaves her water jar. The people in the city must have been very confused to see her because they knew she went to the well and now she's coming back without. But they listen to her when she tells them that, he, that she met Jesus and that Jesus knew these things and Jesus had the new teachings. Given the fact that so many commentators have talked over the years about how she must have been an outcast, the fact that they listened to her and that they came to meet Jesus themselves shows that they must have had some, some level of trust and respect for her. 
Jesus speaks to them, teaches them. Jesus brings some of them into, into the flock of his followers. He's crossing all kinds of lines here. He's crossing gender lines, crossing the, the etiquette of what's normally supposed to be done. He's reaching out to the Samaritans, something that Jews of his time would not have done. And again, as many times, the disciples are con confused and surprised. But when they see the people come and listen to him and they see that Jesus teaches them and Jesus welcomes them in, they, they knew better than to complain. But what do we do with this story? As I've said, often the focus has been on how Jesus broke the rules, and that is certainly a big part of the story. Focus on speculations about the woman, getting into all kinds of gossip and slander. But let's turn that around, because she, in fact, was a very effective disciple. Not only did she choose to follow, she went and got many from her town to come and follow brought other people to learn about Jesus. This is a time when there are still churches that will not accept women as pastors. Recently, the Southern Baptist Church kicked several congregations out of the denomination for daring to ordain women. How many women could have served the church, could have served God's people, and have been excluded from that possibility. What have we missed from not listening to them? As I said, we don't know exactly what was the reason for her multiple marriages, what was her reason for going to the well at a different time of the day. But what can we also learn from his interactions with, with someone who was marginalized? Who are the people who are excluded today? Who can we be looking to try to include and to serve and even learn from? Sometimes this story has been told in terms of her going to the well because she was excluded. What if instead she went to the well at that time of day because she wanted, wanted some quiet, some time to herself? What can we do to seek that kind of quiet? I have a poem that I saw as I was preparing for this that I would like to share by a Christian poet. Her name is Jan Richardson. She says, If you stand at the edge of this blessing, this well, this blessing, and call down into it, you will hear your words return to you. If you lean in and listen close, you will hear this blessing give the story of your life back to you. Quiet your voice. Quiet your judgment. Quiet the way you always tell your story to yourself. Quiet all these, and you will hear the whole of it, and the hollows of it, the spaces in the telling, the gaps where you hesitate to go. Sit at the rim of this blessing. Press your ear to its lip, its sides, its curves that were carved out long ago by those whose thirst drove them deep, those who dug into the layers with only their hands and hope. Rest yourself beside this blessing, and you will begin to hear the sound of water entering the gaps. Still yourself, and you will feel it rising up within you, filling every emptiness and springing forth anew. In this time of Lent, where we remember Jesus going out into the wilderness, let us remember that God provides water and food for us, but God also provides spiritual nourishment even in the midst of our struggles. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 499, Shall We Gather at the River? <clears throat>
As you depart this space, remember that the God who caused water to flow from the rock is the same God who walks with you. Go forth with the assurance that in the midst of a chaotic world, something good can happen and something good will happen. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a good week, everyone.